1953, a desperate young man agreed to undergo an experimental procedure to remove a part of his brain in an attempt to cure his seizures. Henry Molaisen had begun experiencing seizures as a child following a bicycle accident where he cracked his skull. At 27 years old, his seizures were so severe and uncontrollable that he was unable to lead a normal life. His surgeon, William Scoville, was a well-known lobotomist at the time. He had spent his career performing lobotomies on psychotic patients and noted that in some of those patients, the lobotomy had the unintended consequence of relieving their seizures. And so on September 1st, 1953, William Scoville removed a thumb-sized section from both sides of Henry's brain. The majority of the medial temporal lobe was removed, including the hippocampus, amygdala and entorhinal cortex. The surgery did alleviate some of Henry's seizures, but it also left him unable to form any new memories, eventually becoming known in the medical literature as patient H.M. Our understanding of memory at the time was rudimentary. Memory was thought to be distributed throughout the entire brain and tied to other brain functions, such as perception and intellect. But the surgery didn't affect Henry's perception, nor did it dim his intellect. In fact, he scored higher on IQ tests following the surgery. Similarly, his language and motor skills were entirely preserved. It seemed the only thing he had lost was the ability to form new memories. Two years later, in 1955, Henry Molaisen was visited by a memory researcher from McGill University, Brenda Milner, who then spent the next three decades of her career testing and studying Henry's brain, eventually passing him on to her former student, Suzanne Corkett. Though Henry was studied extensively by both Brenda Milner and Suzanne Corkins, it was Brenda Milner's early observations that taught us most of what we know about memory. Milner found Henry to be the ideal study subject. He was highly intelligent, well-mannered and could sit through hours and hours of testing, without ever getting bored or complaining, always eager to cooperate. It was in those early years that we were able to conclude that memory far from being distributed throughout the entire brain, was limited to specific brain structures, namely the hippocampus and adjacent perirhinal, entorhinal and parahippocampal cortices. Together, they are now referred to as the medial temporal lobe memory system. But Henry's memory loss was an anti-rograde amnesia, meaning that he was unable to create any new memories while still being able to recall long-term memories from before the surgery. This is because while the medial temporal lobe is responsible for creating new memories, once these memories have been consolidated over time becoming long-term memories, they are then moved to be stored outside the medial temporal lobe in other parts of the brain. While Henry was able to recall personal events from his childhood with remarkable clarity and able to recognize the faces of famous people who were in the news before his surgery, Brenda Milner found herself having to introduce herself for the very first time every single time she met him. Milner observed that despite Henry's inability to create any new memories or remember things, he was still able to acquire new motor skills. He was able to learn new complex skills such as mirror drawing and was able to retain those skills. This was the earliest demonstration that there existed multiple memory systems that were housed in different parts of the brain. Eventually, we came to understand memory as being either declarative the ability to recall factual information, or non-decorative, an umbrella term that describes skill learning, habit learning, and emotional memory. Things like walking, cycling, and nail biting. We now know that non-decorative memory depends on the basal ganglia, amygdala, cerebellum, and neocortex. These structures were all preserved during Henry's brain surgery in 1953, thus allowing him to acquire new skills and habits. You probably noticed that throughout this video I refer to Henry as simply Henry or as Henry Molaisen, despite him being known in most of the academic literature as patient HM. There are several reasons why I insisted on this. Henry was able to provide scientists with tremendous insight on the inner workings of the human brain throughout his life. Scientists like Brenda Milner and Suzanne Corkins built their careers on the back of Henry's mind. But despite the great debt owed to him, Suzanne Corkins effectively became Henry's gatekeeper, controlling who was allowed and denied access to him. Eventually, she arranged for a distant third cousin, Thomas Mooney, to become Henry's conservator in 1992. Soon afterwards, 
Mooney signed a brain donation form, donating Henry's brain to Suzanne Corkins and her team. When Henry died on a cold winter afternoon in 2008, Corkins arranged to have his brain removed from his skull. She claimed ownership over his brain, his family pictures and all of his belongings. When she saw his brain through the glass after it had been removed, she later wrote in her diary that she felt absolutely nothing at all except ecstatic. It's clear that to Corkins, Henry was not a real person, he was merely a new discovery. A scientific paper to be published, patient HM. An object to be owned and something to build your career on. Perhaps she forgot the desperate young man who trusted his life in the hands of an overly enthusiastic lobotomist, who looked in a mirror many years later, surprised to see his own elderly eyes. I'm not a boy, he'd remark, bewildered. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a heads up. If you really loved it, then you can subscribe to our channel for more great content each and every week. Until next week then.